I started out my career as a scientist in undergrad, actually in high school. I was doing research with one of the universities locally all the way back in high school. I graduated and did research for a little while for Rockefeller University and, sorry, Uniform Services University. Um, didn't want to get a PhD right away because I saw that it was a lot of work and I didn't know what kind of science I wanted to do. So I did the normal thing and I went and became a lawyer, um, which <laughs> is not necessarily a normal thing. Uh, but I saw my friends doing it. It was a lot of money. and It was something I thought it would be interesting to do for a little while. So I did patent law for a little while. Um, and it was interesting. I actually got to work on one of the first CAR-T which I know is a little outside of medical device area, but hopefully everybody knows what CAR-Ts are nowadays, uh, cell-based therapies, one of the first patents for that. Um, but I found I got super frustrated at the number of really cool technologies that kind of got stuck in the patent office. They'd maybe get a patent issued or maybe get an application filed, and then they would just never go anywhere and never get into patients. So I said, hey, I want to change that a little bit, but I need to get a little more scientific training. So I went back and got a PhD. Um, I ended up doing it with Kevin Tracy at the Feinstein Institute, who is one of the biggest names in bioelectronic medicine, which is a pretty new field of medicine, but basically it's zapping nerves to treat different diseases. Uh, we did a lot of immunology, rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease and things like that, those models. Um, but I also found some really interesting new reflexes and things like that. So it was a good science program. And I got introduced to a really cool new technology that has a whole lot of potential. But then I saw that the technologies that were being developed for patients were all implantable or they were a non-invasive thing. And it was like this gigantic box and really loud, and noisy and obnoxious, something the patients would have to go see their doctor for probably even twice a week. Um, and I said, well, that's not really the right kind of medicine for most patients that they're going to want. Um, and I started to get a little more interested in starting companies and being on that side in the startup world. So I finished up my Ph.D., um, after I got a few patents and it was some interesting stuff, um, but I decided to move on and start figuring out how to start companies and work with companies. So I joined the New York State Center for Biotechnology, which is in Long Island. Um, and there it's kind of like an accelerator program. We got some, we were an NIH um, reach uh, site. So we kind of found new technologies and we can do some investments really small, like $50,000, $100,000 investments um, in promising very early stage technologies. So I spent a lot of time working with academic inventors, turning them into founders, turning them into Series A investment seekers. Um, did a lot of good work with that, found a lot of cool things, learned a whole lot on other people's companies and their dime. So I didn't have to make all the mistakes on my stuff and I made it on theirs, which is a good way to learn. Um, I was also chief operating officer of a car tea company for a little while during that time. Um, so I got a little bit of management experience too. And then- I have a then, what company? Have a web company? Of another CAR T company. So I actually, so I always thought I was going to end up doing cell based therapies. So there was a very, there's another alternate universe where we never met because I'm doing cell based therapies right now. Um, but that's okay. That's another good path. But along, so just two years ago, I finally ran into, I'll talk about him in a little bit, but Adam Williamson, who's a brilliant researcher. He's an electrical engineer. He's got a new technology and he was using it to zap very specific areas in the brain and stimulate those nerves non-invasively, just with a bunch of patches. And we said, hey, how do we commercialize this? Um, sorry, I had another thing I was going to say. I was going to say. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, so I found him, said, hey, we need to make non-invasive technologies. We need to develop this technology. And I said, hey, let's let's figure out how we're going to do it. Um, I'm just going to say this. These are a couple of the values that I kind of learned along the way. A lot of good biomedical ideas, but most don't get patients. It's really hard to make a viable business plan because, you you know, a lot of people go the academic route and they get a good technology, but they don't know how to turn it into a company or find a business problem or market problems they're going to solve. And then a lot of times you go the other direction where you get the Theranos and they say, hey, we've got a really big problem. Everybody gets tired of all the blood samples we draw. It would be great if we had one single vial. But if you know anything about the science and the technology, you would say, hey, that's ridiculous. That doesn't work. So it's kind of it's really hard to get a science that matches a business plan and a need and find that part in the middle. Um, and just based on my research, bioelectronic medicine needs more patient friendly options. So anyways, I met Adam. He was doing really cool non-invasive nerve stimulations. I said we said, hey, how do we figure out how to really get these things into patients? And we need a good path to get there. And normally you want to find a nice big market with a big market need and something that's easy clinical trials and all those nice packages and good IP space, things like that. And we stumbled onto obstructive sleep apnea and Inspire's hypoglossal nerve stimulator. So we are now treating obstructive sleep apnea with super crazy high technology 
nerve stimulators. Um, now I'm going to tell you all about that and the company we're starting to do all that. So Somnial is the name of that company. Um, Somnial is it's a word that just means related to sleep and dreaming, and that's where we hope people will be after they use our devices. Um, but so obstructive sleep apnea, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't know a whole lot about obstructive sleep apnea before we got into this space. Um, turns out there are 33 million people in the United States alone that have it, and a billion people worldwide. Uh, it's in the second most common sleep disorder right after um, insomnia. So it's it's a big problem. 80% of people right now are undiagnosed, and we think a big part of that is because the existing treatments are, we've got CPAP or all these other crazy therapies out there, and people just don't want to use it. We think there's also a lot of kind of social psych uh, psychiatry behind it too, or psychology where people just don't put enough value on sleep nowadays. You know, everybody says, hey, I only get four hours of sleep, and they wear it as a badge of honor. Uh, I think that's starting to shift a little bit now, which is good. Um, I see a chat here all of a sudden popped up. I don't, I'm not going to see any of these things, but Joe, if you see a chat I need to talk about, let me know. Um, but yeah, so, so hopefully, you know, things are shifting. People are realizing that sleep's important and hopefully a lot more people will start getting diagnosed after we come out with a product that people will actually use. So what's out there right now? So, oh, no, sorry, medical needs. So it is a really bad problem to not sleep, right? Everybody says, oh, I'm just a little bit tired which is true, but you also have majorly decreased productivity. You're too tired to drive and there are a lot more accidents, especially truck, truck drivers and things like that. It's in pilots, it's a major issue. You're too tired to do the things you wanna do. It kind of sucks the life out of you. And there are actually quite a few health problems associated with it. So there are increased cardiac issues. You're more likely to develop dementias and things like that. So sleep is very important. If you have sleep apnea where you're falling asleep and waking up all night long, then it's a problem and you're not getting enough sleep. So what is out there? So right now, most people know this thing, the, the mask with the machine on the bed and loud noises, and you've got to fill it up with water and clean it, or you get infections, all kinds of issues. People are embarrassed to wear these. Joe Biden wore one and Fox News tore him up for a day and a half, which is you know one of our best marketing <laughs> sources ever. Um, part of it was you get marks on your face like he had. And you know there's a lot of problems. So people are always looking for other things and there's not a lot out there. One of the other things that's out there is this is a little more on the dental side, but oral appliances, which you put them in your mouth like a like a retainer, it makes your jaw go forward and that opens up the back of your throat, and then you can breathe a little bit better. But people don't like these; they cause jaw issues, muscle issues. It, you know, your jaw sometimes can even pop out of place, and you have to put another one in to pop it back into place at the end of the night. Um, and so, the most recent technology that's really been taking off is the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, and that's from the Group uh, Inspire Medical Devices is the, the biggest company right now doing those. There's a couple of others with a couple of other approaches, but they're the big ones and they're by far the front runners. And so the way this device works is they put a surgically implanted nerve stimulator right on the hypoglossal nerve, which is the nerve that controls the muscle in your tongue that makes you do that. And when it does that, it pulls the tongue out of the back of the throat and opens up your airway again, so then you can breathe. Um, it's very good. They have very good ads. It's effective. But people don't like the surgery. It's a complicated surgery. It's irreversible. At least the the implant is the pod. You can pull out if you need to. Um, but people don't like having a chunk of metal stuck in their neck forever. The pod it does have a battery that needs to be replaced after a certain amount of time. Um, but so it has some issues. But it's it's a good proof of technology to me or approach. Um, but that's why we're developing a non invasive version of this. Um, and so this is targeting the same nerve. It's doing the exact same thing as a hypoglossal nerve stimulator from Inspire. We're just doing it non-invasively. Um, and we did, I have to say this on the next slide, but we did get FDA breakthrough device designation for this this year. Um, but nice. just a little when bit more about that. Say it again? When did you get that designation? Uh, I should have looked up the exact date, but it's April 2023 we got. I knew Michelle was going to come off mute. God bless her. What do you have to say about that? Well, Billy and I had a conversation about uh, a couple of months ago, and I think his story about his breakthrough and some of the stuff that the FDA asked was fascinating. Like they asked a lot of detail about their quality management system, the level of design controls, the level of design freeze. Um, so it was just obvious from the way FDA postured with them that they expected a mature company with a mature device. And that and Billy got the the breakthrough designation. So I think it speaks a lot to his preparedness in general for this process. 
Well, and we'll talk about that a little more when I get to my team, but that's definitely, you know, I believe in bringing people that are smarter than me around to do these things. And so- You're an impressive young man, Billy Haynes. I say that on behalf of the entire team. Well, well, th well thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. You, mm -hmm. You've done quite a bit too, so. And I don't think I'm as young as everybody thinks I am, but that's okay. <laughs> but um, so where are we? Um, thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, so, okay, so the technology though. So what we're doing though, is we're using a whole bunch of electrodes, lots of different things, basically the same thing as TENS. A lot of people know what TENS is. Um, you go to the physical therapist and you stick a couple patches on. We're doing kind of the same thing, um, but we're amping it up to kind of another generation. It, it's funny because it's actually based on a, a course Russian technology that was invented in the forties called inferential stimulation. But we're just, it just got rediscovered a few years ago. And so we're the first ones really applying it to treat diseases like we are. Um, but again, so it uses a whole bunch of electrodes, creates a whole bunch of small electrical fields, and then only where they all overlap the right way does it create a stimulation zone. The other places, so even on your skin, things like that, you don't feel the electrical field at all. You don't feel the tens zapping if you've ever done it, things like that. It just passes right through all that tissue, and only where they overlap does it make an electrical field. And we just position everything so it's targeting the hypoglossal nerve and nothing else. So that's that's what our IP is. That's why the FDA is giving us a breakthrough device designation, because if we did just step a normal stimulator under the chin, we'd be zapping all kinds of things like your vagus nerve, which controls all, all kinds of things that you don't want zapped. Um, and we don't want to get too technical today, so we're not going to go into all of them. But the point is we're hyper, hyper focused in a pretty simple way, and we're trying to create a package that's incredibly simple for the patient to just stick on by themselves at home and they don't even have to think about it. It's like putting on a Band-Aid basically. Um, to me, if we can't get to that stage, I don't think we have a minimally viable product yet. You know, we'll make a lot of other things along the way, but to me, that's it has to be something the patient can do easily and, and will use. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with another CPAP machine. So that's the technology behind our device. We did do an early clinical trial, um, and this was recently published in Bioelectronic Medicine. We presented at the sleep meeting recently. Um, we had some interesting results. So half the men responded, all of the women responded, and we kind of expected that, just some weird phenomenon behind the women. Um, and actually, this is something I'd like to get your input on, um, the groups, is we are, so, so we proved this, it worked, women worked amazingly, we don't know why, we have some theories. We're considering making a women's specific device first. Uh, if we're gonna do a 30 day trial, we think there's a chance the men will catch up and start working by the end of it. We think there might need to be some training and things like that, and then they'll start working. Um, but we're going to find that out. And if it doesn't, I am kind of excited about making a women's specific device first, um, just because that means we're going to be able to put a little more design in it. And women don't usually get a women's specific device for things that are not women's specific diseases. Um, usually get the gray off-white box and nobody likes it. And then they stick flowers on it later for the women. Um, but yeah, so that's, so that's where we are with the device and the technology. Um, we're already planning out an ecosystem behind it. Um, it'll connect to an app. So that'll track all the compliance and efficacy. Um, it'll be gamification. So we'll give some feedback and things like that. So the patients will be enjoying using it. Um, we're also going to have it hook up to the physician. So the physician can track how the patients are using it. Um, and they can monitor and control the therapy also. And it's actually interesting because this is actually going to create a new source of income and revenue for the physicians because remote, remote patient monitoring is becoming a big deal, especially in sleep apnea, and I think it'll cross a lot of fields. Um, so they'll actually be able to bill for monitoring the patients over the month through our app. Um, so just another, you know, another benefit to stakeholders. Uh, so yeah, so this is our business model. We're looking at a $2,000 per year per patient, which is pretty close to on par to everything else out there. CPAP's close to that. Um, if you amortize out the Inspire device, which is between thirty and forty thousand um, dollars one time payment, um, it all ends up being around two thousand dollars per year. Um, we plan on being reimbursed by the insurer. It's going to be a combination of the service and the product. It's going to be durable medical goods for the box, and we're going to have some stickers and things like that that are going to be consumable and replaced each night for the patches. Um, like I said, we'll send the data back and forth between the physician. And yeah, you know, it's one of those pretty straightforward, but complex at the same time, this is months. I've been uh, looking down at my phone because I've been trying to get a half dozen people on this call like they need to be hearing what you're saying. 
Well, happy to chat with anybody else if they want to go through anything later, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so the team, I'm going to move, sorry, the Zoom bars in the middle of all this. But so the team, of course, is the most important part of all this, right? So I tried to find the people that I know that are smarter than me in all these different areas and all the places I need help. So Wiley Solomon, who is the chairman and CFO, he was actually CEO with me at that CAR-T company. That's how we met. Um, he's taken companies public before. Uh, he's got some diagnostics experience, so we can put a little bit of regulatory um, input into the things that we're doing. Um, he's a great partner to have around in general. Um, more recent, uh, we brought on Bob Williams more recently. He's our COO. He's done a whole lot of product development as well. And so he's the one that's helping us set up all of our quality systems um, and overseeing all of our efforts that we're doing. Adam Williamson is our scientist. So he is over in Europe, actually. And he has a fantastic team of postdocs and graduate students. They're the ones that do a lot of these trials. They do the clinical trials. They do the development of the devices and things like that. They're the ones that made our prototype. So what we did for that was we kind of hooked Bob up with them, with the graduate students and postdocs to kind of overlay a quality system over what they do. They're students, so they hate it because they don't even like lab notebooks usually, but you know, that's all part of good scientist training anyways. So, you know, that's a big part of our model is kind of educating the younger generation and getting them to figure out how to work with us and do the things that they need to do to get us moved forward. Lee Shangold is our sleep expert. Uh, he's actually a, a partner with my wife who is an allergist, so they're, they're physicians together. So that's how I ran into him. But they're at ENT and Allergy Associates, which is one of the biggest or, uh, ENT groups on the East Coast um, with 200 doctors. So he knows what he's talking about with sleep and he runs that whole division. Um, recently brought on Malin because we started a, a Czech subsidiary um, that we're gonna use to develop a little more of the technologies over there. So she's over in Europe. Uh, she was one of Adam's graduate students, so she knows all the technologies really well, but she also has some experience in developing drugs and bioelectronic devices. Um, so she's been fantastic to bring on board. And barham has been our regulatory affairs, and he really helped us get through the, um, the breakthrough device designation. So he's a consultant right now, but you know that's also been a big part of our model is using consultants. And we, honestly, fiber has been huge for a lot of what we're doing because we're doing a lot more trying to do more project-based things and check off things that we need to get done more than just hiring a whole bunch of people all at once when, especially because the things we're trying to do are so all over the place. So we've had a small group. Uh, we've done a lot, I think, with not a whole lot and we're pretty proud of it. Um, yeah, so this is the a little more details on our where we're going. Um, so right now, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but we're, we're right here at the red box. Um, we're actually gonna start dosing some patients pretty soon. We're, we've got a device. Uh, we're going to send them home for 30 days. Like I said, we want to see if the men respond a little more after they've got a long-term treatment. But those original results were after a single night in a sleep clinic. So that nobody checks things like that ever first night. Um, so, But we had a very promising results after first night. And we think they're just going to get better over 30 days. And we're also going to be testing whether the patients can put on the device every day and do the things that they need to do themselves. Uh, we'll send home home sleep tests with them so they'll wear them every night and we'll have an idea of where it's going. Um, and that's really going to inform a lot of our next steps and kind of help us finalize as we go into our next phase when we kind of do all that final electrical and industrial design work. Um, A-B testing is a big thing that I'm concerned about. You know, form factors, what are patients going to be happy wearing? Um, you know, we've we got to make something they'll wear. Um, and that leads us to our, our pivotal trial. So we think we're only going to need about 200 patients. We're guessing 30 to 90 days um, for a home sleep study. Um, and we're probably gonna split that between US and Europe and probably try to get both, uh, both approvals at the same time. Um, and this can all go pretty quickly too. We've never had a problem with recruitment. I don't know if anybody has sleep apnea, but every time I walk down the street and say we have something new for sleep apnea, people <laughs> dive at me and ask to be in our trials. And I don't think we're gonna have any issues in that area. Um, you know, electrical devices, this isn't hard. This it's easy to make them and scale them up. So I think we're in a I think we're in a pretty happy place with what we're doing and where we're going. Uh then a little more details about what we're doing that you guys might care about. Um so we are thinking class two de novo uh with the FDA just because there aren't any other classification codes right now, but there are quite a few similar mark items, uh, similar products on the market right now. So we could just compare ourselves to basically muscle stimulators and then inspire and then we just need to Come to the middle and do clinical trials to prove that we're okay with treating sleep apnea with those technologies and those things. Uh, 2A and, and EU, 
you know, everybody, you guys have me terrified about the NVR, and I wasn't before, but until I started coming to all these talks, now I'm terrified of the NVR. So we'll just, we'll figure it out though. That's how we do it. You've been talking um, about it. Yeah, it, well, there, yeah, there are a lot of terrifying talks about MDR in here, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. All that's right. how we, that's, that's the other part of our business plan, I think, is that the, the we'll figure it out is, I think, our motto. Um, but yeah, so FDA, we're going to be doing a Q sub in Q1, probably, hopefully January of next year, where we're actually going to present them all of our plans. Um, that's part of our breakthrough device designation. Then we get to talk through it a little bit with them and make sure that they're, we're all on the same page. And that'll also lead to us being able to execute a little more quickly. Um, reimbursement is something we think we need a little bit of work on. Uh, I have some people lined up to work on it. We just haven't pulled the trigger yet because we're not there. Um, the TSET program is something we're looking at. And I know there were some criticisms of it when we talked a few weeks ago about it. I actually think it might be good for us, but we can definitely, I'd love input on that. Um, and, and the last thing is we're, you know, all those features I talked about, we're really focusing on a stage product development. And the first thing we get out there we want it to be the right one. We want it to be really good, but the, it really just needs to be able to stimulate. It doesn't necessarily need all the sensors and feedback loops and things like that yet. Um, so we're going to kind of add those on, like building an onion on the way out. Um, but but we're also in the background. We're working on getting all those pieces together as quickly as we can in the background. So if it does all come together, we'll have an even better product all at once. But if we don't get it together, we'll still have a good product, and then we'll just I assume we'll just five ten k down the road every time we get a new feature and. And that'll be that product development path. And that's it. So tear me apart. Morning, that's what it's I like. Morning. I like when people give me lots of good questions and say all my problems or what we're doing wrong. Well, I, I don't know that you're gonna get a, a whole bunch of that, but uh I lured Eugene off uh silence. No it's morning for me, so I'm in my tea. So it casual. I ran in a hide behind my uh, camera. It's all um, good. I I happen to be using a dental device, and and it seems to be working, and I'm not having the uh, side effects. But um, I put in the chat, but I'd be happy to volunteer and give you the feedback versus the dental device, and see what kind of improvements we experience. Yeah, you know that's that's one of the things we're looking at. Part of it is, part of it is we can use our device with. All these other approaches too. Our device would work with a CPAP. Our device would work if you're wearing a, a, a MAD or whatever you want to wear. Um, so that is something we're going to look at. We'll have to get approval for that and things like that and test that downstream. But the way you know mechanism of action, there's no reason it wouldn't be able to work with most of these things. Um, yeah, I used the CPAP in the past, and I, I couldn't stand it. I just absolutely hated it. But, but the yeah. dental device, it's very easy. It's cheap. You put it in your mouth, put a piece of tape over your mouth, and you sleep pretty good. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to see, you know, what you have because, you know, it doesn't always work. You know, some nights I feel, you know, you sweat, you, you don't, because you actually struggle when you're not sleeping properly in your sleep. Yeah, right. So it's a, it's absolutely critical. I mean, the feeling that you have with a good night's sleep versus an interrupted sleep is, well, let's put it this way, night and day. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and that's absolutely true. And I, you know, I have to say that's the other thing is I've started focusing on my sleep a little more lately since this whole thing. And I definitely am more productive and feel better when I get a good night's sleep. So, yeah. here. But, but that's the other thing is it, I think it's important to make options that people will use. Right. So, uh, you know, if people are just, you have one thing, one thing, one thing, people like different approaches and to have more options available to the patients, that's important. Okay. Well, I dropped my email. So if you want to, uh, ping me that would be great absolutely i appreciate that hey billy thanks what a great presentation what a great strategy i, I really like the product uh, i know people uh i have friends who use the cpap machine and and it's it's a whole routine it's a it's kind of like that you have to there's a lot of time there's a lot of energy spent on mm -hmm. on, on putting it on and and it's like a ritual that you have to go through um uh, so this 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 looks amazing. I'm I'm curious about your clinical results. I don't know if you can put up that slide, but you you said that you tested like four patients in each category, men and women. So this is. The, I had taken off your slide, so if you want to put that back on, just so we could see one another. But he's referring to a slide. If you want to. Well, it's, I'll, I'll just talk about. It. So you're yeah. right. It, that that slide. We actually did 12 patients. I, I grabbed the wrong figure and we did 12 patients. One of the grad students took out some of the big patients because they were over BMI and they weren't supposed to be in there, but 
but the trend was the same. About half the men responded well, and 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 all the women responded well. And, um, and did you dig into like why the men didn't respond? The ones who didn't. Not yet. So you know, was, was it BMI? Was it? This is our, was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a very fascinating scientific question. Um, and we we're actually hiring a student that that's going to be his PhD thesis um, because nobody knows. You know, Inspire actually saw the same thing in their early results that it worked better in women. Uh, their later ones that kind of got buried in that, but it just you know it's it's it wasn't a big surprise to us. Women were easier to move; they needed less energy to move. You know, with a muscle stimulator to move the tongue. We don't know why yet. I, there could be the only thing I found is that men have more fat in their tongues generally. But I don't think that's it. I think there's some nerve-based issues and things like that that we'll figure out at some point. But I don't think it's a safety-related issue in any way. Um, it's just women move more easily. Okay. All right. There's well, a joke thank you. here somewhere. Yeah. Men have more fat in their tongues. I don't know what it is, but loose tongues. Something. We keep trying to think of a good joke with it, but there, you know, it's. I don't have one, and it's probably not going to be non-offensive anyways. So we've stopped. Yeah, I you don't have to use jokes. And come up it's a judgment between us. <laughs> <laughs> but the point though, but I am excited about the idea of making women's device first. I mean, that to me is an interesting possibility. So from a design standpoint, how would that differ? And I'm interested in Rick's perspective as well. Well, all I'll say is that it's going to come down to what we need in, in, as far as technology. The men might need more complicated devices. So the women might end up with a smaller one and the men might need a more complicated one. Um, but otherwise, as far as form factors and things like that, I'd love to hear more. I know that you're not right now, but do you happen to have a prototype on your desk there? Here? No, I don't have it with me. Um, the prototype we're sending home with the patients, though. And again, this is it's the big prototype. But it's the, what we have right now is the size of four cell phones stacked together. Um, and then it's a wire that goes up to a couple patches on the neck. Um, it's huge because we don't know how much power we're going to need. So most of that box is batteries. Um, and we decided to overload the batteries and test the, the power requirements as we go. Um, you know, the electronics are going to be able to shrink. The battery is probably going to be able to shrink a lot for all these things. Um, if we need less power for women, we're going to need far less batteries. So the whole thing is going to be smaller. Um, I'd also be interested to hear if there are any regulatory issues that we think might arise with doing it that way. Um, I did some, some grants to the NIH and they didn't like the idea of a women's specific device first. I'm loving that's okay. that We've got money conversation here because I, I know there are only two hands raised, but I'm sure there are a half dozen that have not yet raised their hands with contributions. Um, Andre. Yeah, Billy, uh, I think this product has a huge potential. Everybody I speak to has sleep apnea, so I Looking forward to seeing this get on the market. Uh, just technologically, just two questions. Number one, do you need a conductive gel to get the transmission of the energy? We don't need one. We're already working with dry electrodes. So that's probably where we'll end up. And then the big question, of course, that I see, uh, you know, we, we design and manufacture some uh, some typical TENS devices or other stimulation device for the vas vagal nerve and so forth. How do you target the specific area and not go through the other tissue? So, so going back to the technology, so the tech, so the way we use these waves, the ones we send in, the first initial ones, they just pass right through the skin. They actually don't, they, they almost turn everything into almost a zero impedance um, tissue conductor. Uh, so they just pass through all that. They don't activate nerves. They don't activate any muscle or anything like that. It's only where they overlap that creates a field where that's where the stimulation happens. And so a big part of it is that we need to put it in the right spot. And it's, you know, it's, it's, we actually designed the configuration a little bit so there's a little bit of error allowed. You don't have to get it, you don't have to like get a tattoo and line it up on the tattoo spot. Um, and we've got some ideas of how we'll make sure the patients do it the same spot every night. I mean, that's not a terribly difficult thing to do. Um, and with a wiggle room, we've been fine. The worst, the worst thing we ever see if we get in the wrong spot is your, your mouth goes like that a little bit because yeah. you hit a muscle that makes your mouth do that face. So, so you're, you're triangulating it to an area? Basically, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. And then when we get into future iterations, we'll be able to get huge arrays of electrodes and really be able to target in a lot more efficiently than we are in, in the first one. So the first one is good enough, but it's just going to get a whole lot better from there. Great. Jose? Hey, uh, yeah, great presentation. Uh, looks looks like a very cool product. Um, so yeah, I, I, similar question. Um, 
to what was asked earlier about the men and, and the women. So I, I run a product development firm and one of our clients right now is actually in this space. So, but, but not on the therapeutic side, on the diagnostic side. So we're developing with them um, a device for diagnosing um, obstructive sleep apnea. And so through that work, I've learned that the causes of sleep apnea are actually quite varied. And some of them happen more, you know, closer to the, to the nose or to the palate. Some of them mm-hmm. are more in the esophagus. And so I, yeah, part of the question would be like, is, is it, possible that you really might, it's, it's not just a question of men versus women, but really maybe among men or even among women, because you've got a pretty small sample size. So it's, you're, you're not, I'm sure you don't feel hundred percent confident yet that the results are indicative of a larger population. Maybe you'll find that as you take on more patients, um, a certain number of women also don't respond and that it could be due to like the, the nature of the obstructive sleep apnea, not just the therapy. So it might be excellent, excellent for patients who have sleep apnea that's caused by a specific physiological issue versus other. And so then on the diagnostic side, you might be um, served by almost having a, a, a classification criteria prior, prior to the studies. So questions on that. And then maybe after we talk about that, uh, some ideas and thoughts um, to consider on the app development side that I'd be happy Would to share. Would conflict for you to help Billy, given that you're working in the space? Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you. I mean, I, like I said, we, we do, we have, I run a product development firm that develops wireless cloud connected medical devices. So every device that we develop has almost exactly the same architecture of yours. There's a device, mm-hmm. electronics, there's wireless communications, there's an app, there's cloud. And so we've learned to do that pretty efficiently. Um, but and one of the things that we have, platform in a box is on the shelf now. Uh, most of it. Yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. So we, we've got a, something called a product development kit, which is taking a lot of those building blocks and being able to develop a medical device much faster than, than if you kind of go down the traditional um, approach. It's like 70% of it, as you say, is is standard. So you can just start with the 70 and then just add as opposed to starting from scratch. Is that the concept? Exactly right. So on the electronics, on the embedded software, like the wireless communications, that's, you know, you're not trying to reinvent the wheel there. Um, even on the app side, a lot of your authentication, registration, onboarding, you know, graphical representations, communications to the cloud, what you find as product to product, those things are, Pretty much the same. We have so to get that message out better, Orquez. I, I think that's a real offer. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, if but we're anyway. so busy making children, maybe <laughs> get something done. Yeah. He's still behind Nick Anderson. Yeah, <laughs> working. Uh, I don't know, Nicky. I don't know if I would raise my hands in victory. Just wait until the college tuition comes around, then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, I only have three so far, so far. Um, yeah, so yeah, so anatomical differences. There are definitely anatomical differences in these patients, and that's one thing that even Inspire has to deal with, right? So things like complete circumferential collapse and things like that. So there are different ways everything collapses. Um, they can look at some things, and they can ahead of time. Other things they can't look at ahead of time. We're in a better spot because we can try our device for a month and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we can throw it in the trash or send it back to us instead of getting surgery and saying, oh my God, the surgery didn't work. Um, so, you know, part of our model even could be diagnosing people for suitability for inspired implantation. And I do, l- listen, I mean, uh, as you know, say our product's the only thing that matters. I do see a place for implants on a spectrum, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's, hey, I had a mask, let's go get surgery. Like that's a big jump. And I think a lot of people don't even know what bioelectronic medicine is as a field. And a lot of people don't want to get a surgery right away. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do too, is kind of, you know, sleep apnea is a great way, I think, to introduce bioelectronic medicine to the world and have a lot more people thinking about what it is and, and using it. So it really is, kind of, this is kind of like the tip of the first iceberg, but sorry, I, I, a bit of a tangent there, but yeah, um, we're looking at that. We think we're gonna be better than Inspire for a lot of reasons too, in some of those cases, because we're bilateral, we're stimulating both nerves. So we're making the tongue go straight out. Inspire is only one side. So a lot of patients kind of go sideways more. Um, so we're going to open up the back of the throat even better, we think, than they are. There are some other implants that are trying to do that same approach, um, but that's where we are. I, I think that's really exciting when you and I spoke about a month ago. Um, Inspire is spending a lot of money. I mean, when you start seeing ads on 60 Minutes, they are spending money on yep. getting the word out. And it wasn't months after I was seeing their spots that I was like, "What? wait, what? There's surgery? I had no idea. Um, that's my listen i think inspire is a good company I, I think that they do a lot of good stuff i like their ads i think controlling that message is their one problem right now because 
Lee, he has patients come in constantly and they say they want the remote, but then he says, oh, by the way, we got to do surgery to get the remote. Then they don't want it anymore. Right. Uh, well, I, you know what I, I think is great is, you know, I talk about positioning and needing a benchmark for people to understand what the device is. And to be if they keep it up, you could say, well, it's like Inspire without the surgery. Um, right. And that's like, please tell more. I mean, what a great concept. I, I still don't completely understand it. Like you said, a lot of people don't. I am among them. Uh, but maybe Rick Stockton does. I don't know. What do you got to say? But, but that's also the point of it, right? We're trying to make something where you don't have to have any idea what it does. You just stick the sticker on every night and you're better, right? And that that's what I want. Because ha most of the world's going to have no idea what this is. Uh, we're also coming to a world where people weren't getting vaccines because they thought Bill Gates was putting microchips into them. And Wait, people what? really believe not? that. A good chunk of the population believed that was at least a possibility they need to think about. And so that's why, for me, it's really important to make something that people can use and feel good about and, and actually use it instead of putting it on and being like, well, is this going to zap my brain? It wouldn't be the first time I wasn't paying close enough attention, but this is the first time I think I heard you say the word sticker. I don't know if it is, but that's basically what it is. It's going to be a sticker-based electrode. goes on underneath and see, this is what I like though. If I'm not doing a good job telling my story, you no, miss something. It's you not, not doing a good job do listening job. and typing at the same time. But but, but that's so okay. is that a is that a sticker? Like every day you need a different sticker. So what we're so we're working on the final design for the electrode, what's going to be stuck on. But the final thing will be something you stick on every night and then you take off every morning. Um, whether it's a reusable, that portion is all reusable, or whether it's a, re, a tear away electrode and we throw the electrodes away. We're playing with a couple of different designs there, but that the it will be something you stick there and something you pull off. Your shareholders like it when you throw things away every day. And they do. They do. They work. Yep. Mr. Sorry, Stop. You, sorry, you were calling on Rick, I think. I did. Yeah, no, I, I did get the unlike Joe, I wasn't I didn't have to contact a bunch of people to get them on this conference. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I figured. It looked like you were gonna stick it on. And and that's a great way to go on working with a company that makes applied on sutures and there are so many non-irritating adhesives or at least or at least I know of a family of them and uh, and it doesn't and you can modify the amount of adhesive so that you can take it off and you don't gradually remove all the epidermis or whatever um, and and Joe is wondering what I thought about the design I think usually at this stage at this stage you've got your guys putting together an idea for a prototype sometimes I won't Sometimes I won't come into a process until they're going, okay, now we've got to make it work. You know, we've got to make it small. It's got to be practical. And I'll be working with the molders and I'll be working with the electronics guys. And, and they'll be saying, they'll be saying, well, we'd like to do it like this, but, um, but that's probably impossible. And I'll go, no, I don't think that's impossible. What do you really want? And then we'll get going on some ideas. But um, I think it's, I think it's about the coolest idea because when you start looking at, when you start looking at actually having to get surgery and stuff like that, when you start looking at anything, you start thinking, okay, I'm going to lose some weight. And then you get to a place where you're going, okay, but it's still a problem. And, or there's still this, or there's still that. Then you're looking for something, but you still don't want to go under the knife if you can avoid it. And so the, and so maybe the mouth guard thing doesn't really work all that well. And maybe this would be an amazing idea. And sure, I'll, you know, I've gone, I've gone to camping and retreats with guys with CPAP. And it's kind of like they have to bring their race car set with them, you know, and set it up and everything like that. There's tubes and whooshing and everything else. And and I guess it's better than what they experience without it. Okay. But uh, so what you're doing is amazing. And, and well, really, I come into the process at any point, but, but a lot of times it's just, okay, now we have to make this so that it'll really be comfortable. We have to miniaturize it. And we also have to make sure that we can manufacture it reliably. That's yeah. the biggest thing people run into. I got a call from somebody recommended by somebody in this group. And the thing that they're developing is pretty good, but they're realizing that it really could use some significant improvements before it goes to market. And so I'll be talking next week with the guy who's doing that. Um, and he's a, like you, he's a PhD and, and uh, very smart guy and he's developing something very neat but that is that is that part of the development process where you basically have your breadboard you got this giant thing right because it's got all this power you don't know how much it's going to need yeah so you know it's a hummer well an mgtd really would have done the job 
but you don't know that now. So you're going to be optimizing like crazy. All right, you just briefly on Slack and let me know who you're talking with, if you're able to, York. Yes, thanks. Um, so I uh, have been a CPAP user for probably almost 20 years. And um, I, I have some questions. I mean, you know, for example, I, I can't sleep without it. I mean, I can't take a nap. I can't do anything. So, hmm. and then the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, you know, when you're sleeping, you're sleeping in a, you know, your neck is, is actually compressed in this area. And I don't know how electrodes are going to feel or in that kind of situation. And also if they're only single use, what happens if you're taking a nap? You know, that means you got to use two in a day or whatever it is. So you, it starts going going up, which I guess is a good from a business perspective. Um, and then you also need a device. So what is the difference, you know, if I have a CPAP um, and I have to carry that around and there's hoses and, and you know, as, as everyone said, it's true. But I have this device that I have to carry around just as, easy, just as well. So I, I guess I would give some more thought to um, how do you differentiate it from from CPAP in that way? Because, you know, the CPAP works really well for me. It's, you know, it is a hassle, of course, carrying stuff around, but you're going to have to carry stuff around as well for your device. So I, I, I just think that whole user experience is something that you probably need to spend some time on. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I mean, obviously, this is the right direction. Non-invasive um, treatment is is definitely where people are going with this and uh so just just my two cents and i've you know like i said i've been a 100 percent utilization of my cpap every day for t literally 20 years so um it's something that uh you know I ha it's anecdotal because i'm only uh, an of one but um you know if you need any uh input from someone of that nature i'd be happy to help um that's great i appreciate that um, it, so two things that were raised actually really quickly. So one is that, yeah, CPAPs are terrible to travel with. A lot of people need a whole separate suitcase just to travel with that. Our device is already tiny and it's battery operated and you're going to need a pack of probably band-aid thin adhesive strips is probably what it's going to be to bring along with it. And we're, and, and this is already, you know, this is a prototype. This is the, the worst it's ever going to look. It's this big already. It's going to come down in size very quickly too, I think. Um, so you know, right there, even this device, we could probably commercialize and say, hey, you don't have to carry your CPAP around anymore. You're already better off. Um, so I, I think, but I, you're right. I appreciate all that. And we're designing things that you're going to be able to sleep with too. So I'm not, we're keeping that in mind as much as possible. But the other thing that Rick brought up was the weight issue, right? So a lot of people say, oh, I, if I just lose a little bit of weight, then my sleep apnea will go away and all that. It, the problem is if you're not getting enough sleep, it's really hard to lose weight. And if you're not losing weight, then it's really hard to get enough sleep. And then you end up in a cycle where you just can't lose the weight and you can't get rid of your sleep apnea. So for some people, they do lose the weight and then their sleep apnea goes away, but you got to get something to get there first. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is right at the beginning, we're just targeting HI is 15 to 50, which is moderate to severe and BMI is up to 35, which is what Inspire did have. They just raised theirs up to 100. A lot of sleep physicians aren't sure that they love that going all the way up to 100, but they go up to 100 now. I think we're going to stick at 50 because there's a lot of people that are still there. Um, but that's that's where we are. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear from our team anesthesiologist. Eddie, what do you have to say about uh, what you've heard today? Well, um, first of all, the tongue is a very soft structure, so it moves around. And when you are asleep, the tongue, I mean, if you, if you think about the jaw as like a cutting board, and you got a ball of dough, which is your tongue sitting on it. Now you start to tip the cutting board vertically, which is the position it becomes when you're sleeping. That ball of dough is gonna fall back, right? And so this is why the oral appliances really don't work very well because um, they force you to have reverse orthodontics at night, uh, every night. And it, it, it would clearly with, you know, with time, basically cause the occlusion to fluctuate um, back and forth. And also, when you're obese, you have a lot of 
uh, adipose tissue build up in your tongue. Your tongue gets fatter when you're fat. I mean, when, when you're overweight. And they also build up of uh, layers of fat in between all the muscles in your cheek. So that's why the uh, OSA becomes worse when, when the person is obese and intubation of an obese person is quite a nightmare. And the one thing that everyone can do to help the um, OSA, whatever the uh, degree of OSA they may have, is to put their neck or head into what we call the sniffing position. If you pretend you're looking, trying to see something up at the top of your head, and in fact, if you if you roll, you know whether it's a firm foam or even a bath towel under your neck, that will relieve the um, obstruction to a very significant degree. That's the position we put the patient in just before we intubate to give us the best straight shot down to the vocal cords. And um, I, I think what uh, Billy has uh, is a is a is a really good idea, and I I applaud uh, Billy for uh, all that he's done. I I personally would not go with the OSA device because of its transient nature and long term uh, adverse effect on dentition. You will it, it basically moves the root of the teeth back and forth every day. And I cannot imagine that it will have a good long-term effect. CPAP is very difficult to tolerate for a lot of people. Uh, but for those who are able to, you know, uh, definitely more uh, power to them. But I, I do believe uh, this is a great direction to go. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Should be your I like your pizza dough analogy. That's, that's perfect. Uh, that's a good, on the cutting board, that's a good one. Uh, that's it is. Exactly I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the reality. And uh, a lot of people do not realize it. It is very positional. So most people get it more when they're on their back. So the frontline treatment is actually, is behavioral. So they teach you to sleep on your side. And if you can't do that, they stick tennis balls behind your back and all kinds of other things where you sleep any other position than your back. Um, so it's a big problem. People are, some people are also worse in REM because of all the, all of your muscles relax. And so then your tongue really, it turns into not even pizza dough, it's jello, then just falls right back. But Ed, we, one of the things we, it's, it's great, you're an anesthesiologist. One of the things we talked about a little bit was, is there a case for this in anesthesiology? You know, when patients are coming off anesthesia, they're in their covered room, they might have sleep apnea. We kind of got to the point where it, they just slap on a, on a, a, on a, on a CPAP or whatever on them. And that's probably good enough. So we don't want to get into a market that's already over, that's already addressed. But do you have any thoughts on that? Do we do we have any reason to go into anesthesia recovery? That's a very interesting uh, thought. Um, I think there is potential there. Yeah, I don't want it. So part of it is we don't want to get distracted. Again, we're small. We're trying to stay laser focused. We've got a thousand ideas and a thousand things we're doing in the background and getting ready for. But we're laser focused on sleep apnea. We want to get that done. But we're trying to keep the whole picture in mind and make sure that we're designing towards all those other potentials that they're there. Um, we're just not sure can about that. Can be useful. Can be useful. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Nikki, does Lady have anything to contribute to today's call? Are, are we doing something? Well, you're off mute. Does lady, do you have anything to add? Do you want to say anything? I can't hear you, Nick, although you're not on mute. She said this one's green and this one's blue. And there's a pink one upstairs. And there's a pink one upstairs. So. <laughs> That's a very sweet little voice. That's cute. Uh, that's cute. Hey, lady, what are their names? What are their names? No, no names. No, everything <laughs> to this point has been named Lady. She's named everything after herself. Why not? I know. Why not? With a name like Lady, you know, it looks like Fraggle Rock. Those are pretty That's nice. right, uh, Fraggle Rock. <laughs> Make her talk more. Can you talk a little bit? Say hi to everybody. No. <laughs> uh, no I'll just have to get that little recording bit. Yeah. To Sousa, it's good to see you again. 
Yes, sir. How you doing? Good to see everybody. <clears throat> and Billy loved your presentation. I kind of uh, was just wanting to jump in with just something to tuck in the back of your head. I, I do a lot of work in the supply chain space and contract manufacturing and product assembly. And I sort of pick up where Jose leaves off with his uh, design work and all his elements, getting a product ready, and then what? And then, you know, he gives me a call sometimes, which is amazing. Uh, but the idea I want to just plant in your head, I know it's small. I know you have the, you know, subscription, the replenishables and things like that. But think of your product um, design, the DFMs designed for manufacturing elements to be modular. Because as you iterate, and you make an improvement hypothetically in the battery pack or in the in the sensors or in this and that. If it's modular, you can do an upgrade at the component level and it'll still slap together. Uh, one of the big things we're doing is, you know, suggesting that people reconsider their China strategy, reconsider the global supply chain strategy, bring the flexibility of getting components wherever you can, approve two or three vendors for redundancy, right? Uh, and then bring, it's much easier to ship flat boxes or small packages of components and slap them together closest to where your customers are. Mm -hmm. Call it the last mile manufacturing model. Uh, and especially as you ramp, a lot of contract manufacturers who the old model where you just went to one place, the volumes might make a difference. They might really get you to commit to high volumes that holds up cash flow, you know, things like that. So just think about that. You know, I think you're a year, year and a half away from it. But at the design level, think of the design levels, the, your elements to be modular, your components mm -hmm. to be modular, will give you flexibility until you mature the product. Then you can go, boom, it's solid. Now we can go to market. Nice. Well, between Paul and Rick with the design for manufacturability and scale, I think that is great. In the meanwhile, I'd love it if the engineers on the call can help Mark Matthews with the proper glasses construction where they sit properly on a space. I don't know what what you guys are working on in the optical space uh, that might help Mark. Sorry about that. I, I break so many glasses. I always break the glasses. It's missing an arm. So maybe like a, an indestructible optical device, Rick, if you can work on that. Or maybe check with Andre on material selection or something. I don't. I don't know. I cannot believe it took us an hour and eight minutes for finally comment on Mark's glass. Cause I, even with a two-year-old on my lap, I was like fixated. <laughs> well, these glasses are that is high praise for me being able to focus yeah. the presentation. You've made a lot of progress, Joe. We're I, proud I've of you. I've been working so hard, Nikki. <laughs> I've been, you've been gone for a couple of weeks. Where have you been? You're, you're like the regular, you're the first one on the call every week. It was on vacation in Ireland. Oh, right. Europeans a month off. Sorry. And, forgot. and, and even, even for Irish people, it rained a lot. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> I have to say that was actually our one slowdown. Everybody in, every most of the people working on this are in Europe. And yeah, we definitely, July, beginning of August, it was just shut down for a while and yep. we figured it out. But That's I've all. missed half of your presentation, so I have nothing to add now. Okay. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you going on, on, on replay, of course. Well, as, as I think is abundantly clear, there's a lot of love in the room. Thank you, everybody. And uh, next week, Karen Deep will be with us to talk about effective computer software validation. So uh, let's see if Orcas is still on the call. No, he's dropped off, but I'll make sure he's on. Uh, wishing everyone a good weekend. Uh, Billy, don't be a stranger. Uh, I think I'm speaking for everyone. That's exciting. And uh, I know Marin invests in like everything. So I don't know when you're doing your next round or something, but there's probably some loose change sitting around this room too. What have you, is it all been friends and family so far? So it's been a combination of, of founder funded and a little bit of grant, actually a good amount of grants. And we, we actually, technically we have enough to get through the pivotal clinical trial and, and grant funding. Um, you know, if we find the right partner, you know, we, we're probably going to go VC money next year. If we find the right partner, a right strategic investor, um, obviously that's something we would look for. Um, there's a lot of value in going faster and having partners that bring, you know, good resources and help us move things forward. So that's what we're definitely looking for smart money if it's out there um, and somebody's interested in contributing in other ways on top of capital. Uh, but technically, I think we're good. 
for now, actually, money wise. It'll be the long, slow path, but we'll get there if we need to. But we're open either way. Is, Carl, how are you doing? I'm, you still have any of the money I, I sent you in the bank? Yeah, yeah. We are, we're still, uh, what, less than 12 weeks away from FDA, our first submission. So fingers crossed, just got off uh, the phone with our strategic partner, the largest needle company in the world, and they're already talking about our second device. So I think I got an NSF grant that's been hanging over my head. Finally, I, I think we've, we finalized the budget justification. So hopefully we'll start on our second grant for? $275,000. Busy. Non-dilutive nice funding, yeah. Fingers you don't have another round coming up because I've had a couple people say, hey, I didn't get a... Yeah, we do have another round coming up. We're actually raising a Series A um, and we're going to apply for the, Q the BIITC that refund that Maryland has. Takes forever to get your money. Hopefully you get your money, Joe, right? Not yet, no. Not yet. No, apparently there was form 502CR that needed to be sent in at the same time as the 505. I don't know. All I know is that I've been looking at my bank being like, where's my... So this uh, program she's in is a Maryland-based biotechnology incentive tax program where when, I'm a when I eventually receive that refund, uh, they are, Maryland is writing me a check for one-third of the investment I made in Zeus Company. So if I put in 100 bucks, I'm getting $33 back and my equity is worth 100 Probably 110 by now. Am I right, mm -hmm. Susie? Yeah. Okay, that's not official. <laughs> um, so you can do worse than uh, than get in your car and drive all the way to profits. Yeah. I just, I just thought that up. Yeah. Hey, Harris, hey, what do you do? Tell the people at home. Who is it? Sorry. I was asking Barry what he does once he finds the mute button. There we go. Yeah, so um, I have a, a company called uh, BSM Medical, and what I do is help early stage and startup organizations as a fractional leader. To um, I've had a lot of experience with uh, contract development and manufacturing organizations. I uh, ran Synectic Medical up in Connecticut. I also ran Surtech Medical. Uh, so this is very uh, some of the products that Billy, you're working on. Uh, we uh, we did some development work on. And uh, so now I've taken that uh, knowledge and uh, uh, help small companies and come in typically on the operation side of things and manage all that, get them kind of re as real organizations, get them certified with quality systems, put in financial systems, and then help them with the product development and manage their outsource partners and actually find them for them. That's just though you'd be a, a valued member of our little family here. So could that some thought. Yeah. Um, if I can help anybody, let me know. Happy to. Well, I know Mark Matthews needs help. If you can help him with this ocular situation. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'll see you next Friday. Yep. Thank Thanks you all everybody. again for all your comments. You. This is great. Yeah. Great weekend. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye now. Bye.